So we have seen some definitions of sets and some operations on them. So let's look at more examples to get familiar with the notation and the terminology of sets. So remember that a set is a collection of items. And when we write out a set, if it's a finite set, then we can just enumerate the items in the set by writing them within curly braces. On the other hand, if we have an infinite set, we really can't write out all the elements, even though informally we put dot, dot, dot to indicate a sequence. If that sequence is not very regular, for example, supposing it is a set of prime numbers which doesn't have a clear pattern, then it's not very easy to represent it explicitly like this. So we saw that there will be another notation called set comprehension that we'll come to. But before that, let us talk about the two basic relationships between sets and membership of a set. So membership is denoted by this element of relation. So a small x typically denotes a member or an element of a set, and capital X usually denotes a set itself. So when we write small x belongs to capital X like this, what we mean is the element small x belongs to capital X. So for example, the number 5 belongs to a set of integers, and square root of 2 does not belong to the set of rationals, for instance. Subset, on the other hand, says that one set is included in another set, so everything that belongs to x belongs to y. So for instance, all the prime numbers are natural numbers, so the primes are a subset of the naturals. Every natural number is an integer, so the natural numbers are a subset of the integers. Similarly, the integers are a subset of the rationals, and the rationals are a subset of the reals. And we draw this using these Venn diagrams, where we draw these ovals or circles or boxes representing the extent of a set. It's a picture of a set. And then depending on whether a box intersects another box or it sits inside a box, it indicates whether the first set is a subset of the other one or they overlap and so on. So in this particular diagram, which also has colors, we have indicated the subset relationship between the different types of numbers that we have studied, the naturals, the integers, the rationals, and the reals. And finally, one very useful thing to know about sets is the power set. So when we take a set, we can enumerate all its subsets. So remember that we have just defined a subset. And in particular, we have this special subset called the empty set, which is a subset of every set. The empty set has no elements in it, but we need it for technical reasons, and it is a subset of every set. And in addition, if you have a two element set A, B, then the subsets could be the individual elements, the set containing A and the set containing B, or the entire set itself. So once again, just like the empty set is a subset of everything, the set itself is also a subset of itself. And we argued that for a finite set with n elements, we will always have 2 to the n subsets. So here, for instance, we have two elements. So we have 2 to the 2, 4 subsets. So this is just a review of what we have already seen. Now let's look at this set comprehension notation, which is what we said we would use when we have to describe infinite sets, which cannot be written down explicitly. So this was a typical example. So supposing we want to write down the set of all the squares of the even integers. So the even integers are minus 2 plus 2, 0 is even, minus 4 plus 4, and so on. But if we square them, then we know that minus 2 squared is the same as 2 squared is 4. So this set on the right, which is written in this informal dot, dot, dot notation, has 0 squared, 2 squared, 4 squared, 6 squared, and so on. So how would we write this out? Well, this is that notation on the left, which says that we take every x which belongs to the integers, check whether it's even whether x mod 2 is 0, and then square it. So let's just break this up into parts so that we remember exactly what's happening. So first, in the set comprehension notation, we have a generator. A generator says that we are taking elements from an existing set. So we can only build new sets from old sets. So we already have a set of integers, and we are going to try out every integer in this set. So that's what x element of z says. Try every x in z. So z generates this set. Now. All the x's that come out are not interesting to us, so we want to filter out those that are useful, that satisfy a given property. In this case, the property that we are looking for is that the number is even. So we want those x which come out of z through the generator such that they satisfy the property that x when divided by 2 has remained as 0, which is the property that x is even. And finally, with these x, we don't want to keep them as they are, we want to transform them. So on the left-hand side of this vertical bar, okay, this is the left-hand side are the actual elements of the set. The elements of the set are generated on the right, then filtered through some conditions which rule out the ones we don't want. And when the ones we keep, we can transform them. In this case, we want the squares. We don't want the even numbers. We want their squares. 
So if you look on the right, this is what happened. So when we started the generating process, we had all the integers. Then we filtered out and we got only the even ones, right? And now we transformed them. So for each even number, we produced its square. And now in this process, you'll notice that minus two squared is four and two squared is also four. So some elements will disappear because we do not keep duplicates. So finally, when we go through this, we end up with this sequence, four, zero, four, and then in this, we'll throw away all the elements on the left and we get the number of sequence on the top, right? So this is how set comprehension works. So we can write filters in many different ways. As long as it's unambiguous, we will not be very particular about the language we use so long as there is no question about what we mean. So for instance, we looked at this example. We have rational numbers, but some rational numbers are not in reduced form. For instance, if I write four by 10, then I should actually think of this as two by five, because it's two by five times two by two is equal to four by 10. So I've actually multiplied and both the numerator and the denominator by two for, to go from two by five to four by 10, but it's the same rational number. So we want the numerator and the denominator to not have any common divisors, which is the same as saying that their greatest common divisor is one. That is nothing other than one divides both the top and the bottom of the fraction. So if we take all the rational numbers, so we generate all the possible rational numbers, P by Q, which belong to the set of rationals. Then we filter out those which have no common divisor between the numerator and the denominator, and we keep only those. We don't transform it in any way, we just keep it here. So here the transformation is just to keep it as it is. This is sometimes called the identity transformation. The identity just takes an input and produces the output the same as the input. So this gives the set of rationals in reduced form. So here we have used a function GCD, even though we have not formally defined it here, we assume that people understand what GCD means. So this is what we mean by saying that we can write the filter in any reasonable way as long as people understand what it means. Another example we looked at are intervals. So here we want the real numbers which start from minus one, including minus one and go up to but not including two. So in this case, we will use less than and less than equal to. So we will take all the reals. So we take every possible real number but we are not interested in all the reals. So we check whether it is greater than or equal to minus one. So it includes minus one and everything above it. So it cuts off everything which is strictly smaller than minus one. But we also don't want it to cross two. So we stop below two. So it should be greater than or equal to minus one or and less than two. And if so, again, we keep it without any transformation. And this notation on the top, the square bracket and round bracket, are indications of whether the endpoint is included or not. So the minus one endpoint is included, the plus two endpoint is not included. So let's see why we would actually want set comprehension notation. So let's extend our first example of squares of the even numbers to cubes. So a cube is just a number multiplied by itself three times. So a square is x times x, a cube is x times x times x, three times. So if you want the cubes of the first five natural numbers, we can write it out explicitly like this. We can take this generator and generate the first five natural numbers as zero, one, two, three, four. Remember that in our terminology, natural numbers start with zero, even though in some books you will find that natural numbers start with one. We always assume natural numbers start with zero. So the first five natural numbers are zero, one, two, three, four. So this is our generator. Take every n in this and transform it to n cube without doing any further filtering. We're not asking for the first five odd numbers or the first five numbers which have some other property. We're just take, taking the first five numbers. Now imagine that we change this question to the first 500 natural numbers. Then though we can write it out explicitly, it's rather tedious, right? So we have to replace the small list of five numbers by a long list of 500 numbers. And remember, we are not really allowed to write dot, dot, dot if we are being math mathematically precise. So we actually have to physically write out these 500 numbers. Now this is not terribly convenient. On the other hand, we can define the first 500 numbers quite easily using set comprehension. So we can say, give me all the natural numbers, that's the generator, but restrict the natural number to be less than 500. So remember that the first 500 natural numbers are going to be zero up to 499. So now this says that this, this set X is actually this long set here, which we have written explicitly. Right? So we have replaced that very long and tedious expression by a much more compact expression, which captures exactly the same set. So now we can have a much more readable version of this 
cubes of the first 500 natural numbers. As an intermediate set, we generate the set x. Set x is the set of all n such that n is less than 500. And then we take this as the generator and we say, okay, take every n which belongs to this x. So now we know that x is restricted to 0 to 499 and then take the cubes of these numbers. So we get n cubed in this range. So this is one other use of set comprehension, which is to make our definitions more readable and understandable and less tedious to write. So let's look at one more round of examples. So we saw this before, we talked about perfect squares. So we said that some integers are squares of other integers and some integers are not squares. In particular, those which are not squares, their square roots are actually irrational. We proved, for instance, in a supplementary lecture that the square root of 2 is irrational. So a perfect square is an integer such that its square root is also an integer. So this is what this says, give me all the integers which satisfy the condition that their square root is also an integer. So square root of small z also belongs to a set of integers. Give me all such z and call it a perfect square. Now notice that a square must be positive. We have already discussed this because you multiply two negative numbers, you get a positive number. You multiply two positive numbers, you again get a positive number. So in fact, a perfect square must always be non-negative. It could be zero. So we could as well assume that the target set is generated by the set of natural numbers and that we are only interested in the positive square root. So remember that 4 has two square roots. The number 4 is either minus 2 times minus 2 or plus 2 times plus 2. But it is sufficient to know that one of its square roots is an integer because the other one will just be the same with a minus sign. So we can as well define the same set of perfect squares in terms of the natural numbers. We generate all the natural numbers whose square roots are also natural numbers. Now we can turn this around and replace the filter by a condition. So we know that every natural number when it is squared will give us a natural number. So all the perfect squares will be generated in that form. Take a natural number, square it. So instead of looking for those numbers whose square root is a natural number, we can just take every natural number and square it. So we just generate all the natural numbers and without filtering them, we just take the output squared. So this also gives us 0, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared and so on. So these are all different ways of writing the same thing. In one case, we replace the generating set from integers to natural numbers because of the property of perfect squares. In another case, we transform the filter into a transformation. So instead of putting a condition on the numbers that we are generating, we took all the numbers and then squared them to get the actual perfect squares. Now we could extend the notion of perfect squares to other sets of numbers. For instance, Rationals can also admit a definition of perfect square. So a rational will be a perfect square if it is a square of another rational. In particular, a rational could be an, an integer, but we will now, integers can also be uh, above and below the line. So we could have 9 by 16, for instance, as a rational number, which is 3 squared by 4 squared. So 3 by 4 into 3 by 4 is 9 by 16. So we might want to say that this is a perfect square in the world of rationals. And not everything is a perfect square because since square root of 2 cannot be represented as rational, it's easy to check that half cannot be represented as a form p by q whole square. So not every rational in this sense is a perfect square. Some are, some are not. So we can again change the definition above and replace z and n by q and get a reasonable definition of perfect squares in a different domain of numbers. So we can say give me all the rationals, small q, such that square root of q is also a rational. Or using the second form, we can say take all the rationals and square them. Right? So take every q which is a rational small q and give me q squared. So this says that depending on how you choose the generator, you might generate the same set or you might generate a different set. So it's important to specify all the parts of a set comprehension correctly so that there is no ambiguity and so that you get, get the set that you mean to get.